You can't even do household chores, so we might as well get a divorce. And you better give me your assets too, James said with a smirk as he walked into the hospital room. I was hooked up too many machines, but that didn't stop him. A girl I didn't know stood next to him. James didn't realize I had $10 million in assets. He should understand that a divorce in this situation would be a matter of life and death for a housewife like me. Fine, he has the divorce papers, I thought. I couldn't stay with a man who verbally abused his wife. I pulled out the divorce papers I always carried with me and handed them to James. Grinning, he accepted them. Now I can say goodbye to you. I'll be happy with her, so don't worry. Right, Patricia? James said, wrapping his arm around the girl's waist. Her name was Patricia Heaton. James sneered at me, and she said, Take care, Mrs. O, you're not Mrs. anymore. Take care, ma'am. They both laughed as they left the room but their happiness wouldn't last. Alone in the room, I laughed out loud. Today is Friday, so the divorce will be processed on Monday. I can't wait for three days from now. My name is Nicole Wallace. I'm a 47-year-old housewife. My family runs a regular farm. I don't have any special skills, but I'm proud of my vast cooking repertoire. My husband James is the same age as me, and we were college classmates. We both came to Florida from the countryside. Since we both lived alone, I used to cook various dishes for James using the vegetables and rice sent from my family. People often said I captured his heart through his stomach, and I knew it was true. James has always been incapable of doing any household chores. I've been taking care of him since we started dating and after we got married. I continue to handle all the household tasks. Sadly, we didn't have children, but we enjoyed our life together as a couple. We both loved to eat, and on James's days off, we'd often go on drives to enjoy delicious food. When we first got married, James was kind, but after about five years, he became controlling. He never hit me, but his remarks became harsh, often saying, Whose money do you think we're living on? Those words hurt, but I didn't have the energy to fight back assuming he wouldn't listen anyway. Being a full-time housewife made me feel inferior and I couldn't stand up to him. James joined a well-known company after graduating from university but quit after about six years. He quickly found new jobs but would resign from them after short periods. Because of this, our income was unstable. We managed by looking for money-saving tips but often struggled with our finances. However, at the company he'd been with for the past three years, he seemed to get along with his colleagues. I had faint hopes he might stay there for a long time. Then one day, James came home earlier than usual. I'm home. I quit my job, he said. What again? I said, surprised. James' eyebrows twitched. I stopped cooking and rushed over to him. I'm sorry. I was just shocked. No welcome back, and you're criticizing what I do? You've become quite bold, James said. His words made me freeze. James was in a very bad mood, and if I said the wrong thing, it could get worse. I'm sorry, I said. As long as you understand, he replied, somewhat placated. He sat on the sofa and turned on the TV. I quietly placed a beer and a glass on the table. Do you want dinner or a bath, I asked. Food and alcohol, he replied. To avoid upsetting James, I played the role of a submissive wife. I once had a strong sense of self, but after 16 years of marriage to James, since the age of 30, I rarely showed my true self. After eating and drinking to his heart's content, James fell asleep, snoring on the sofa. The table was a mess, like a child had eaten there. I cleaned up the fallen beer bottles and food scraps on the floor. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Recalling my dreams of a happy married life from my girlhood days, my true feelings slipped out. I glanced at James suddenly, but he showed no signs of waking. Relief washed over me, but I also felt dread about continuing this life. Maybe I should consider divorce. I started planning my schedule for the next day, determined to face the issues I had been avoiding. The next day, James started visiting the employment office and quickly secured another job. 
While he was job hunting, I went to the city office and signed divorce papers. I wasn't ready to submit them, but having them felt like a kind of protection. I hid the signed divorce papers at the bottom of my bag. If James found them, who knows what he might say or do. Hey, where did you go while I was job hunting, he asked. I went to the stationery store to buy some resumes. Look, I thought you might need them, I said, trying to sound normal. James, who got home before I did, initially interrogated me suspiciously but quickly cheered up. I handed him the resumes I had bought earlier. After receiving them, James said he was going out for drinks with a friend and left. James's new job was at a reputable company with a solid salary and better benefits than any job he'd had before. When he got promoted after working there, for about two years, he celebrated with a drink. I secretly hoped that maybe this time he would work there until retirement. James's department seemed to be in sales, and he started to leave home more frequently for evening events. I enjoyed my brief moments of freedom and gathered energy to greet James with a smile when he returned. One day, I received a call from my mother. After a long time, hearing her excited story took me by surprise. Ten million dollars? I asked, stunned. Yes, ten million. You know the mountains and lands we owned? We don't need them anymore. We had them appraised, and they are worth fifteen million. We only need three million to enjoy the rest of our lives, so I think you might want to rethink your life too, she said. My mother was never fond of James. She was worried about me, especially after James became more controlling, preventing me from even visiting my childhood home. I was stunned by the amount she mentioned. Furthermore, I was shocked to learn that when my mother inherited the property from my grandmother, she changed the title to my name so there were no inheritance taxes. It's better not to tell James, but the final decision is yours, she said, hanging up the phone. I felt conflicted between the urge to immediately inform James and the desire to live freely with that money. About a week later, I was involved in a traffic accident. Thankfully, my life wasn't in danger, but I'd need to stay in the hospital for about a week. After storing my valuables in the hospital room drawer, I immediately contacted James. I'm sorry, I got injured, I said. Huh, what about my meals? James's reaction made me almost laugh, prioritizing his meals over my injury. I'll need to be hospitalized for a week. I'm really sorry, but could you buy your meals elsewhere until then? Not even preparing meals for your husband? What a lazy wife. Oh wait, I'm coming over now, James said and ended the call abruptly. I was planning to tell him about the inheritance tonight, but now I thought it might be best not to mention it. Looking at all the tubes attached to me, I had a feeling my intuition was right. You're useless, can't even do housework. Let's get a divorce, and you better pay me compensation too, James said with a smirk as soon as he entered the room. I was connected to several machines, and a girl I didn't recognize stood beside him. James didn't know that my total assets amounted to $10 million. He should realize that a divorce under these circumstances would be a life and death matter for me, a housewife. Fine, here's the divorce papers, I said. I couldn't stay with a man who would hurl abuse at his wife in this condition. I handed him the divorce papers I had kept as a sort of charm. James took them with a smug smile on his face. With this, I can finally say goodbye to you. I'm going to be happy with her, right, Patricia? James said, wrapping his arm around the girl's waist. The girl, named Patricia, leaned against James and scoffed at me. Take care, madam. Oh, you're not a madam anymore. So take care, old lady, she said. With those words, they both left the room laughing. But their joy would be short-lived. Left alone in my room, I burst out laughing. Today is Friday, so the divorce papers would only be processed on Monday. Oh, I cannot wait for three days from now. Just as I had expected, the weekend went by without any contact from James, and it was quite peaceful. I was restless, not used to doing nothing. Since getting married, I was always busy. Every time I got restless, the nurses told me to stay calm. 
Then, on Monday evening, I received a bunch of calls from James. I ignored them at first, but after fifteen minutes of constant ringing, I decided to answer. Could you not be so persistent? I said. Hey, what's the meaning of this? James shouted as soon as I picked up. I couldn't help but laugh. James seemed infuriated by my laughter and started screaming incoherently. What are you talking about? I asked. Don't play dumb. The divorce papers aren't being accepted, are they? James was huffing and puffing on the other side of the phone. I continued to chuckle and responded to his complaint. Oh, I had previously filed a non-acceptance notification. Remember how you used to say, let's get divorced, every time we had a fight? I thought it wouldn't be good if you filed for divorce on a whim during one of our arguments. Ew, but I don't need that now. Withdraw it immediately, James demanded. I can't do that until I'm discharged. We need to go through procedures at the municipal office, I said. Then discharge now. Don't be unreasonable. His selfish demands made me laugh even more. He probably wanted to register his marriage with Patricia, whom he brought on Friday. By the way, was her name Patricia? She's your mistress, right? Hey, that's rude to Patricia. Apologize, she's my new wife. We're not divorced yet, so she's technically your mistress, isn't she? I responded calmly. James made a weird groaning sound. I decided to hit him where it hurt the most. By the way, you'll hear from my lawyer about the division of property. That's right, property. Including this trouble, you better share properly. I'm not sure why he misunderstood, but James suddenly sounded in high spirits. After all, the responsible party has to pay the compensation. I had always done my household chores diligently, and of course, I had never cheated on him. It's clear as day that James is the responsible party. What are you misunderstanding? You're the one who has to give me the assets, James responded, genuinely confused. He likely believed that by not taking care of him while I was hospitalized, I would truly be at fault. Even in my parents' time, one wouldn't be deemed at fault for such a reason. I bitterly thought this as I listened to his rant. I explained to him patiently, What fault of mine are you talking about? Just so you know, not being able to do housework because I'm in the hospital doesn't make me at fault. You've abandoned taking care of me. If you were a child, it would be considered neglect, but you're an adult and should be able to take care of yourself. That's why it doesn't make me at fault. If I say you're at fault, then you're at fault, James insisted. Even a judge would be shocked by his baffling logic. I pictured myself facepalming. Did he really think such childish reasoning would work? Don't you know what's legally defined as grounds for fault? Being at fault means things like infidelity, like having another woman despite having a wife. That's why Patricia is my new wife, and you're no longer of any use to me. So it doesn't apply, right? What are you talking about? Since you were dating her behind my back, it's clearly cheating, I said. James still didn't seem to understand. He was set on believing he was right. Either way, please communicate through a lawyer from now on. Goodbye? Hey, Nicole, he shouted, but I hung up the phone without listening to his protests. He called multiple times, but when I ignored him, he eventually gave up and went silent. I was relieved, but the next day, another headache-inducing event occurred. Feeling frustrated by the non-stop ringing from nine in the morning, I pressed the call button. On the other end, James was complaining at me like a machine gun. At first, I wasn't sure what he was saying, but piecing it together, it seemed he was complaining about not being able to withdraw money from a bank account. If it's a joint account, James should be able to withdraw without any issue. But if not, I recalled the bank cards and passbooks I had left at home and asked, were you trying to take money from my account by any chance? Exactly. You're still in the hospital, and I was going to take the money into account, but the card won't work. James rumbled on with his unreasonable argument. It seemed he didn't understand what I said yesterday. When I was scheduled to be hospitalized for a week, I had called the bank 
and requested they prevent withdrawals until I was discharged. I could handle it personally after being discharged. It was to prevent James, who was reckless with money, from depleting my savings while I was in the hospital. My decision was proven right. It's unthinkable to try to withdraw money from the account of an ex-wife you've divorced. However, James didn't see anything wrong with it and asked me to make a withdrawal immediately. What are you talking about? We are practically strangers now. Why would I do as you say? I replied. You and my life haven't changed even if we're getting divorced. Act like a proper wife and listen to me, James insisted. We are not legally divorced yet, but we are already strangers, got it? Unfortunately, I don't have money to give to strangers, I said. James was shocked since I had never resisted him this much before. But he quickly became assertive again. Just do as I say. Send the money now. Pay the compensation for not doing housework, he demanded. Even though he was academically capable when we first met, he seemed to lack common sense. Eighteen years into our marriage, it was clear I had made a poor choice in a partner. James seemed frustrated that I wasn't giving in. He likely had exhausted his cash on hand and probably dipped into the living expenses I had left at home and from our shared account. I spoke to James as if I was talking to a small child. Listen, I'm no longer your submissive wife. We'll settle the property division through a lawyer later on. What? You're so insolent. I'm coming over right now. Just wait, James said, hanging up the phone. I didn't mind if he came to the hospital, but I had already asked the nurse's station not to let anyone in except for my parents, so it was unlikely he'd make it to my room. James really did come to the hospital, but as expected, he was stopped at the nurse's station. My phone kept ringing, but after ignoring it for a while, it switched to messages, and my screen was flooded with notifications. I saved all of them as evidence and contacted my lawyer. After a while, it seemed the lawyer had gotten in touch with James as the messages stopped coming in. I thought it was the end, but my hopes were about to be dashed. There's a visitor named Julia. Would you like to see her? Julia, please let her in. Julia was a friend who shared my hobbies back then. When I was single, Julia, and I became close after she responded to my posts on social media, where I shared my dining experiences. We discovered we lived nearby and often went out to eat together. After getting married, I couldn't dine out as much to save money but we kept in touch by regularly meeting for tea and chats. Nicole, are you okay from the injury? Julia asked as soon as she entered the room. Yes, I'm feeling much better now. Thank you, I replied. Julia's immediate concern warmed my heart. I realized that since my hospitalization, aside from my parents and the hospital staff, no one had shown concern for me. Hey, Nicole, things are tough for you right now, aren't they? Julia asked. Huh? Why? I hadn't told anyone about my situation other than my parents. I wondered how Julia knew and asked her, intrigued. Julia then said something shocking. You know Patricia, the young girl, right? She's having an affair with your husband, isn't she? What? How do you know about that? Wait, you know her? Actually, she's my niece, Julia replied hesitantly. I was so surprised that I couldn't close my mouth. Who would have thought that Julia was Patricia's aunt? The room went silent. It was the first time there was silence when Julia was around, and it made me feel uneasy. Patricia suddenly told her mother, my sister, that she's getting married. What's more shocking is that her partner is 47 years old. When I saw the photo, it was your husband. I was so surprised. I've already told my sister. I'm so sorry for all the trouble my niece has caused you, Nicole. Don't apologize, Julia. It's not your fault, I said. Julia looked like she was about to cry. I'm thinking of demanding compensation from Patricia. I can't compromise on that. But if I do, does this mean our relationship will end? Of course not. I want to continue being friends with you, Nicole. I'll make sure Patricia pays compensation. Neither my sister nor I can forgive what she's done. We'll keep a close eye on her. I was very grateful for Julia's words. 
We've been friends for over 22 years. I didn't want to lose a precious friend because of my terrible husband and his mistress. I scheduled a meeting with them tomorrow, and I'd like you to come with me, Julia said. Of course, I'll be there, and I can also provide photos as evidence of their affair. The next day, fresh from being discharged from the hospital, I prepared for the meeting. I went to a private restaurant room with my lawyer. James and Patricia had already arrived and were indulging in an expensive traditional meal. I was speechless at their audacity. You finally made it. Did you bring the money? Remember, you are paying for this meal, James said without even stopping his meal. Patricia continued to eat with a smug look on her face. I decided to fight back. Please handle the payment yourselves. I came here to demand a fair share of the assets from the two of you. How long are you going to sulk? You're really unattractive, James remarked rudely. Ignoring his comments, my lawyer and I took our seats and showed evidence proving James was at fault. We first presented legal documents about the reasons for liability, followed by documents on property division. Lastly, we showed the photos Julia had provided, which showed Patricia and James together, as well as Patricia with another man entering a hotel. Wait, why? Hey, Patricia, what is this? James and Patricia were visibly shaken by the photos and finally stopped eating. Just then, Julia made her timely entrance. I took those photos, Julia said. Patricia seemed confused as to why her aunt was present. With cold eyes, Julia looked down at Patricia and James and calmly spoke about being friends with me for 22 years and how their actions were despicable. Patricia, you mentioned that the baby you're carrying is his, but given your actions, who knows who the father is? Wait, no, I. This was the first time I was hearing about her pregnancy. Judging by her appearance today, one would never guess she was pregnant. However, James's reaction showed he believed her claim. So, you're pregnant. In that case, after a DNA test, I'll demand an additional penalty. No, I'm sorry. I lied about the pregnancy. Please forgive me, Patricia suddenly admitted, bowing deeply. She had been searching for wealthy old men, and James was her target. He bought her designer goods and promised her a life where she wouldn't have to work and could do as she pleased. She believed she could be a housewife and occasionally have flings with men of her choice. She had once lied about being pregnant because James showed no signs of wanting to divorce. James froze with his mouth agape when he heard this. I'm truly sorry, but I can't give you anything. I don't have the money, he said. I'll pay Nicole in advance. Patricia, you're going to work part-time diligently every month and repay me. You won't have any free time until you've paid me back in full, Julia said firmly. Oh no, Patricia looked disheartened. Julia mentioned she would bring Patricia back later for another apology and took her out of the restaurant. James, in shock the entire time, seemed to snap back to reality and approached me in a flattering tone. Look, it seems I was deceived. I can't live without you, Nicole, right? We still have the divorce papers here. Can we start over? You've always been a housewife, so you can't possibly work now, can you? He pleaded. I listened to James's pleas with a cold gaze, none of which moved me. I waited for him to finish before answering with a smile. I can live just fine without you. I'll be taking the divorce papers and filing them shortly. Also, I never mentioned this, but my personal net worth is currently around $10 million, so I can live comfortably without working for the rest of my life. Rest assured. $10 million? Why did you keep such a fortune a secret? James asked, shocked. I was about to tell you when you started making a fuss about divorce. This money is my personal inheritance, so it doesn't count towards marital assets. It has nothing to do with you, I replied. James looked at me with utter despair. My lawyer quickly produced some documents and a pen for James to sign. The lawyer and I then left and immediately filed for divorce ending our almost 22-year marriage. Later, Patricia transferred some money to my account. According to Julia, upon learning of this incident, 
Patricia's mother was furious. She made Patricia take a leave from university and work nonstop at a relative's inn until she paid the compensation. James, on the other hand, was disowned by his in-laws after they learned about the divorce. He was told he wouldn't receive any assistance, so he reluctantly took out a loan and paid me in one lump sum. Furthermore, it was revealed that he had been with Patricia at a hotel during work hours. He was fired from his job and is now juggling multiple construction jobs to repay his debts. As for me, even after receiving such a large sum, I didn't know what to spend it on, so I donated half to charity. I then moved to the countryside with the remaining money and am now enjoying a luxurious single life. I've continued my friendship with Julia. On our days off, we go on food tours and short trips. We both plan to stay single, so I suggested maybe we should share a room. Initially hesitant, Julia agreed when I mentioned we could share deliveries and she could join my meals. Moving preparations started the following week. As I packed up my old life, I felt a sense of excitement and anticipation for the new chapter ahead. The thought of living true to myself, free from the chains of a toxic marriage, filled me with joy. Julia and I found a beautiful house in the countryside. It was spacious and surrounded by lush greenery. We both loved the tranquility it offered, a stark contrast to the chaos and stress of city life. We set up a cozy living space, complete with a kitchen where we could continue our culinary adventures. As we settled into our new home, our days were filled with laughter and good food. We explored local markets, tried new recipes, and even started a small vegetable garden. The simplicity of our routine brought immense satisfaction. Julia and I grew even closer, sharing not just our home, but also our dreams and plans for the future. Despite the hardships I faced, I realized that my life had taken a turn for the better. The toxic relationship with James was a thing of the past, and I had found a true friend in Julia. Together, we built a life filled with love, respect, and mutual support. One sunny afternoon, as Julia and I enjoyed a picnic in our garden, I reflected on my journey. I had gone from feeling trapped and undervalued to experiencing freedom and contentment. I had discovered strength I didn't know I possessed and learned the importance of standing up for myself. The lessons I learned during my marriage and the subsequent divorce were invaluable. They taught me resilience and the importance of self-worth. I realized that happiness comes from within and that surrounding yourself with supportive people makes all the difference. Julia and I often talked about our future plans. We dreamed of traveling, exploring new cuisines, and perhaps starting a small business together. The possibilities seemed endless, and for the first time in a long while, I felt truly optimistic about the future. Life in the countryside was peaceful and fulfilling. The fresh air, the sound of birds, and the beauty of nature provided a perfect backdrop for our new beginning. I had found a sense of purpose and joy in the simple things, and it was a feeling I cherished deeply. As the days turned into weeks and then months, Julia and I continued to thrive. Our bond grew stronger, and our friendship became the foundation of our happiness. We supported each other through thick and thin, always knowing that we had someone to rely on. Looking back, I realized that leaving James was the best decision I ever made. It allowed me to rediscover myself and build a life filled with love, laughter, and true companionship. Julia and I had created a haven where we could be ourselves, free from judgment and filled with joy. In the end, I learned that life's challenges often lead to unexpected blessings. My journey taught me the importance of self-respect, the power of friendship, and the beauty of living authentically. I was excited for the future, knowing that with Julia by my side, anything was possible. I was determined to live my life joyfully and true to myself from now on. I looked at my dad's bank account and saw nearly $600 million in it. I thought to myself, this money is all mine now, I don't need you anymore. After my kind father-in-law passed away, I was still grieving when my husband came to me and casually dropped the news that he wanted a divorce. 
It turns out he was only showing his true colors after getting his hands on the $600 million inheritance from his father. He saw me as nothing more than an ATM, just waiting for dad to pass away so he could live a lavish life without having to work. I had seen glimpses of his true nature before, but I never realized he was this awful. Before I knew it, I was clenching my fists, angry at myself for being fooled into this marriage. I could accept being deceived, but I couldn't stand him speaking badly about my kind father-in-law. Fine, I said, hand me those divorce papers. I snatched the papers from my husband, signed them quickly, and threw them back at him. All right, the rest is up to you, I told him. Yeah, leave it to me, he replied, smugly. He offered to send my belongings, and I walked past him, out of the living room, and left the house. I knew my husband would regret divorcing me. Sure enough, he called me later, panicking when I explained that the $600 million was just a fantasy. My name is Mary, I'm 45 years old, and I work in sales. My husband John is also 45, and he used to work in sales, but now stays at home. There's a story behind him becoming a homemaker, but to explain that, I should start with my first husband. This is my second marriage. My first husband died in a work accident five years ago, leaving me a widow. Between life insurance and severance pay, I received about $600,000. Since my first marriage happened later in my 33s, we didn't have any children. I inherited the money along with my ex-in-laws, but they told me, we're almost 82 years old and don't have much time left, so we don't need it. I couldn't accept that and decided to give the money to my ex-brother-in-law and his wife, who were living with my ex-in-laws. However, they also said, we don't need much since it was my brother's money. You should use it, so they only took a small portion of the money. In the end, after paying a significant amount in inheritance taxes, most of the money ended up with me. Combined with our savings and the fact that I had a job, I became fairly well off by the age of 41. But even with all that, sitting alone at home and looking at the numbers in my bank account, I felt empty. When I came home from work, no one was there, and no one ever would be. The bed beside me stayed perfectly made, just as it was before I went to sleep. The worst part was when I accidentally made breakfast for two. As I took a bite of the second piece of toast, I thought, this must be what it feels like to have a hole in your heart. I really wanted to take some time off, but I had to keep working, so I went back to my job with this emptiness inside me, constantly feeling a sense of void. I desperately wanted someone, anyone, to listen to me, and that someone turned out to be my current husband. When I told him about my husband passing away and how I had to take some time off because of it, he said, I'm sorry for any inconvenience. I quickly replied, no, no, it was no inconvenience at all. Besides, your husband was a lucky man to have someone who cared for him so much. I'm sure he was very happy. He then shared a bit about himself, saying, as for me, I'm terrible at relationships. Even when I do date someone, I get dumped quickly. I know it's because of my careless personality, but it seems hard to change who you are. My husband and I were business acquaintances before we got to know each other better. I knew he was a cheerful person, so when I visited his company, I ended up telling him everything. Normally, anyone would find such a dark and heavy story off-putting, but he listened quietly and then cheered me up with some light-hearted jokes. His words and smile seemed to fill a bit of the hole in my heart. He continued to listen to my stories, and we started meeting outside of work. One day, while we were talking, I accidentally dropped a receipt, and he jokingly said, Wow, my wallet is twice as thick with coins. You dropped a receipt, and we both laughed. I need to organize it, but it's such a hassle. When he tried to pay at a store, receipts started falling out as he pulled out some cash. I picked up the receipts and handed them back to him, and he stuffed them back into his wallet, complaining about the coins. It seemed like the receipts were also making his wallet bulky. You're like a kid, John, I teased. What? I'm 45, you know, he replied. 
just as he said, he was a bit careless, but watching him, I felt the hole in my heart slowly start to close. We kept meeting privately, and a year later, he told me he had feelings for me. It had only been a year since my previous husband passed away, so I was torn, but I felt like my late husband was telling me, don't stay stuck, move forward. So I decided to start dating John. People around us had their opinions, but making that important decision helped me begin to heal. However, just a month later, John gave me an even bigger concern and asked me to make an incredibly important decision. Shouldn't we get married? Given our age, it's better to decide sooner rather than later. This time, I couldn't hear my late husband's voice guiding me. It felt like he was telling me to trust my own intuition and keep moving forward, so I decided to marry John. Okay, let's get married, I said, surprising even myself with how quickly I made that decision. It was likely John's personality rubbing off on me. I started to think that a bit of carelessness wasn't so bad if it made me more positive. At the same time, I learned from John that too much carelessness could be problematic. Wait, live with your dad? I asked. Yeah, just recently, he got sick and needs help with daily living. He kept working past 73, thinking he was still young, and now this happened. What about your mom? Is she helping him? Huh, didn't I mention it? My mom's not around. My parents divorced when I was young, and I haven't seen her since. This is the first I'm hearing of it. Sorry, don't be mad but it's a heavy topic to bring up when we weren't sure about getting married yet, right? I figured I'd tell you later. Even if you put off talking about living together, you could have told me about your parents. I would have known that living together might be an option. Well, let's not sweat the small stuff. Just meet my dad and then decide if you're okay with living together. And if I say I can't live with him, we'll figure it out then, John said with a smile but I couldn't smile back. I'm not planning to say I don't want to marry you just because I don't want to live together. I just wish he had told me the important things earlier. I thought being careless wasn't so bad, but now I see it's not a good thing after all. In the end, I agreed to meet his father, as John suggested. Then I began to understand what he meant by small stuff. Your house is pretty big, I said. Just a bit. It's just me and dad so we have some extra rooms. If you move in, you can use any of the spare rooms, John replied. I was about to meet his dad for the first time, so I was a little nervous. Ignoring my feelings, John opened the gate and walked towards the front door. His house was three stories high, slightly bigger than the neighboring houses. Living there with just the two of them seemed quite luxurious. That's what I thought, but John seemed dissatisfied. Dad's so stingy, he should have built a bigger house, he muttered to himself, but I was too nervous about meeting his dad to confirm what he said. Dad, I am brought her, this is Mary, John said. Nice to meet you, I said. Sorry to greet you from bed, it's been hard to move lately, his dad replied. Please don't strain yourself, I said. John's father propped himself up with John's help. He wasn't bedridden and it seemed he could get up and walk slowly with a bit of help so he could manage with some assistance. Despite his physical issues, his father seemed sharper than I expected. So, Mary, you're in sales for office equipment. With the move to paperless offices, selling the hardware must be getting tougher, right? His dad asked. Yes, industry-wide, equipment sales have been declining for about 11 years so everyone is focusing on new services or business expansion, I replied. Considering that the domestic market for the equipment is almost saturated, you need to look at countries where there's still demand for new services. IT integration might be the way to go. I think there's something called MPS, right? He said. I completely forgot I was talking to my future father-in-law. The conversation flowed so naturally into work talk that I switched to work mode. His father didn't push too hard on the marriage topic either. He was probably being considerate of my feelings. After just a few minutes of talking, I found myself respecting him, 
I started to understand why John called living together small stuff. He probably knew I wouldn't oppose living with his dad. About 30 minutes into our conversation, his father said, My back's starting to hurt. Sorry to cut this short, Mary, but I need to rest. Please take care of John. He's quite a chatterbox. Sure, I will, I replied. Is sure the right response? His father seemed to cut the conversation short to avoid burdening me. I wanted to talk more, but I didn't want to tire him out. Feeling a bit disappointed, I left with John. On the way back, John told me more about his dad. Dad's a serial entrepreneur, John said. A serial what? I asked. A serial entrepreneur. He starts companies, grows them, then sells them. He's done it multiple times, John explained. You can just buy and sell companies like that. I was surprised. Well, yeah. Selling one company involves millions of dollars. Starting and growing a company also needs a lot of money, so the sale isn't all profit. But still, Dad's pretty well off. He just doesn't like to spend. He could build a mansion that would make Jaws drop, but he doesn't, John said. Don't you know much about his work? I asked. He doesn't talk much about work or money. He never hired me for his companies or taught me how to make money. Living at home is the only way he spoils me. If he's got so much money, he could spoil me a little more, don't you think? John replied. Your dad probably has his reasons, I said. It seemed his father was quite an impressive person. It made sense that John might feel overshadowed by him. Given how incredible his father is, John probably got compared to him a lot, so it's understandable that he'd have some complaints. By the way, why did your mom leave? Your dad seems so kind. It's hard to imagine their marriage not working out, I asked. Mom spent a lot and wanted an easy life. After the divorce, people only came after dad's money, so he decided never to marry again. He focused on work instead. With that much money, he could have spent a bit, don't you think? John answered. I don't believe in spending money just because you have it, I said. From what John told me, it seemed his mom relied on his father's money, so I couldn't agree with John on this point. But I think his words came from feeling inadequate compared to his father. Later, I talked with John about living with his father. His father currently relies on John for help and also gets assistance from a home helper when John is at work. I thought my husband and I would continue working while getting help from a home assistant to take care of my father-in-law. However, John surprised me with a different idea. I want to quit my job and take care of Dad, John said. What? Quit your job? I was shocked. Dad's such an incredible person, right? I feel like I haven't done anything for him all this time, so from now on, I want to support him without relying on a caregiver. I'll be like a homemaker, John explained. I'll take care of the house, too, John said. Are you sure you won't regret quitting your job? I asked. I'd regret not doing anything for Dad more. I can go back to work after he's gone, he replied with a small smile. That joke isn't funny, I said, feeling worried. I thought my husband might resent his father, but it turned out that wasn't the case. Despite everything, he really cared for his dad. If you're going to be a homemaker, you better handle the housework properly, I warned. Leave it to me, John said, puffing out his chest confidently. Since my father-in-law would cover his own expenses and my income would be enough for the two of us, I decided to leave the housework to my husband. When we got married and started living together, everything went as planned. I worked and John took care of the house. He managed the chores, handled the finances, and supported his dad. When I tried to help, he would say, you're tired from work, I'll handle the house stuff. You rest. My father-in-law remained kind and shared many valuable stories with me. Our second marriage was going well. However, I noticed that my father-in-law would sometimes frown when he saw John doing housework. A month after we started living together, John began slacking off with the house chores. You're sleeping on the couch again. You've been there all day, haven't you? I asked. No way. 
I went to the fridge when I was thirsty and to the bathroom too, John said, trying to defend himself. That's not what I mean. What about dinner? Did you go grocery shopping? I asked. Dinner's ready. Don't worry, he replied. I glanced at the kitchen, but there was no sign of any cooking. All I saw was an empty container on the dining table. It was clear he had been lazy all day. From this, I realized what John meant by dinner's ready. Perfect timing, the intercom rang, and John grabbed his wallet and headed to the door. I was too stunned to say anything. John had only handled the housework diligently for the first three weeks. After that, he gradually stopped doing anything, and I ended up cooking, cleaning, and doing the laundry. It's typical for someone with a careless personality to start strong and then quickly slack off. Caught up in the excitement of getting married, I hadn't foreseen this. My father-in-law, on the other hand, must have predicted it early on, which is why he frowned when he saw John doing housework. As my husband began to shirk his duties, my father-in-law started apologizing to me, saying, That boy is so careless. I'm really sorry, Mary. I hoped he'd become more responsible after getting married, but it seems he's just causing you trouble. If he becomes a burden, feel free to kick him out. I wouldn't do that. Really, it's okay. I'm sorry. I've tried to correct him, but he's just, well, you know. It's okay, but he isn't neglecting to help you, right? I asked. No, he does help me, at least a little, I replied, noticing a slight change in my father-in-law's expression. It was clear that John wasn't completely ignoring his father, but he also wasn't doing a third job. Still, my father-in-law was probably downplaying the situation to avoid any conflicts between us. I'm sorry, I said. No, Mary, you don't need to apologize, my father-in-law replied. With just one word, sorry, he seemed to understand what I was feeling. We both apologized, and there was a bit of awkwardness between us. To break the tension, my father-in-law quickly changed the subject with a brighter tone. Oh, I'm doing some end-of-life planning and need your help. I'm not confident in John handling it. End-of-life planning. It's not as negative as it sounds. I just want to avoid any trouble later. Got it. If there's anything I can do, I'd be happy to help. Talking about John made us both cautious, so we ended up avoiding discussions about him and housework. It was an uncomfortable way of being considerate, but there were also thoughtful gestures that made me happy. Is there anything inconvenient at home? My father-in-law asked. Not really, but the bathroom could use some fixing. I had just wanted the water heater checked, I said, but my casual comment turned into something much bigger. Wait, what's this? I exclaimed when I saw the changes. My father-in-law had contacted a contractor he knew and they completely renovated the bathroom. Not only were the tub and shower replaced, but the walls and floors were redone with special coatings to resist grime, and the drain was redesigned to make cleaning easier. They even installed a bath lift to help my father-in-law get in and out easily. Now I can enjoy a nice clean bath, and it's easier for me to get in and out, he said. It was an extravagant use of money, and this happened a few times where a small request turned into a huge upgrade. I learned not to ask my father-in-law for small favors lightly, yet my husband still called him stingy. I couldn't understand how John could see it that way, given how generously his father spent money. Out of curiosity, I asked my father-in-law about his most extravagant spending. What's the most luxurious thing you've ever done? I asked. I started a seafood company in Germany, built the office and the factory from scratch. That cost a fortune. A company in Germany? That's impressive, but it was work, right? Well, yes and no. I did it because I wanted to, so it was more like a hobby. Why seafood in Germany? Was it because it was profitable? No, I had no knowledge or connections and didn't think about profits. Germany exports a lot of seafood and we import a lot of it. I love seafood, so I thought I could make money and eat all the food I wanted, he said, looking happier than I'd ever seen him. He must have really enjoyed that time, but if he just wanted seafood, 
he could have bought as much as he wanted. Starting a company overseas seemed extravagant. Do all successful people think this way? It's a world far beyond the understanding of an ordinary person like me. It made me realize that my father-in-law wasn't stingy. He was just careful about when and where to spend money. My husband just didn't understand that. One day, my husband burst into David's room and vented his frustration at both of us. You listened to Mary's requests, but not mine. Are you talking about the bathroom? You use it too, right? And since cleaning is easier now, it's a big help to you as a homemaker, right? Mary gets to enjoy a nice bathroom, and it's convenient for me too. No one loses here, David replied calmly. My husband clicked his tongue loudly and stormed out, slamming the door behind him. I'm really sorry, I said. It's fine, but why don't you listen to your son's requests? I asked. He's like his mother. When he has money, he spends it without thinking. Even with a lot of money, you need to understand its value and how to use it wisely. I've tried teaching him that many times, but he's still the same. David said, his expression turning somber. Since that day, my husband had become even more neglectful. Not only did he stop doing anything around the house, but he started causing unnecessary trouble. Whose motorcycle is that outside? Did you buy it? No one else's motorcycle would be here. I yelled at my husband as soon as I got home from work, but he just polished an expensive-looking golf club in the living room without even looking at me. My husband had stopped doing housework and started buying whatever he wanted. I wouldn't complain if he was spending his own money, but he was using my bank account without permission. You get your requests granted by dad. Let me have a bit of luxury too, he said, trying to justify his actions. He had been diligent as a homemaker at first, and I hadn't seen this lazy side of him before we got married. It seemed he had been hiding his true self before marriage. I was completely fooled. When we got married, I told my husband, if my salary isn't enough for our living expenses, feel free to use the money in my account. I took back my bank book so he couldn't use the money without my permission. When I checked it, I saw he had spent around $50,000 in just three weeks. It was an expensive lesson that I couldn't trust him. Naturally, I thought about divorcing him but I didn't want to leave my father-in-law in his care, so I erased divorce from my list of options. My husband seemed to sense that I wouldn't divorce him and became even more arrogant. Hey, can't you come home earlier? I've been waiting for dinner all this time, he complained, treating the living room sofa like his personal nest and hardly moving from there. Of course, he did no housework at all. What does being a homemaker mean? I was starting to lose my understanding of it. He had said he didn't want to rely on a home assistant and wanted to be a good son, but he ended up hiring a caregiver again. Honestly, this made me feel better knowing my father-in-law wasn't left to my lazy husband. I decided to avoid my husband as much as possible, thinking, let sleeping dogs lie. With this mindset, the year flew by quickly. Then a significant event happened for both me and my husband. Thank you for everything. My father-in-law passed away just before turning 81. The time I spent with him was short but incredibly meaningful to me. It felt like we had spent 11 years together. Even after the funeral, I couldn't pull myself together and felt a deep void in my heart. As I sat in the living room, lost in emptiness, my husband walked in with a cheerful expression. Hey, let's get divorced. What? That single word snapped me out of my daze. He was waving the divorce papers in my face. It wasn't a misunderstanding or a joke. I found Dad's bank account. Guess how much is in it? Nearly $600 million, so this money is all mine. You're no longer needed, ATM. When Dad collapsed a year ago, I didn't want to deal with taking care of him, so I looked for a wife. I figured you'd be an easy catch since you were grieving the loss of your previous husband. I see, so that's why you were in such a hurry to get married. That's part of it, but then I changed my strategy. You inherited money from your late husband, right? You never talked about it, but I figured his retirement and insurance would be substantial. 
I took care of Dad while you acted as the ATM until he passed away. It was easier than working. Now that Dad's gone, I'm set for a lavish life with his inheritance. Do you think you can get away with this? I asked, feeling the anger rising. Of course, I'm his son, so it's only natural I inherit his wealth. He worked until he collapsed, and I thought he'd live until 87, but he died sooner than expected, so I'm lucky, he replied smugly. I realized I was clenching my fists. It was my fault for being tricked into marrying him, and I could accept that but I couldn't forgive him for speaking so badly about my kind father-in-law. I was ready to punch him, not caring about the trouble it might cause later. But then I felt like I heard my father-in-law's voice saying, Stay calm. Right? There was no need to do anything rash. Are you sure about this? All right, give me the divorce papers, I said. I snatched the papers from my husband, signed them on the spot, and handed them back. Thanks for making this easy. I'll file these tomorrow. You can take all our savings. I've got $600 million, so take as much of that petty cash as you want, he said, clearly gloating. Okay then. Yeah, leave it to me. I'll file the papers and send you your stuff if you want, I replied, walking past him and out of the house. As I left, my anger started to fade, and I felt a wave of laughter rising. My husband would soon regret divorcing me that $600 million was just a pipe dream. A few days later, while staying at a hotel and looking for a new place to live, my ex-husband called. Hey, what the hell did you do? He yelled. I instinctively pulled the phone away from my ear as he started shouting. He seemed confused, so I needed to explain what was happening. I can guess what happened, but why don't you tell me? I asked calmly. When I tried to withdraw money from Dad's account, they said this money can't be withdrawn. What's going on? There should be $600 million in there, he said, his voice full of frustration. Looks like you didn't know. Since your dad didn't spoil you, you never took an interest in his affairs, right? And he never discussed his work with you, I explained. Stop with the riddles. There's money, right? He demanded. Yes, there's $600 million, but it's collateral, so you can't touch it, I replied. Collateral? He asked, his voice shaking. That's right. The money is in the account, but it's untouchable, like a pie in the sky. Also, that money is about to be used to pay off debts, so it'll be gone soon, I explained. You're kidding. There's $600 million, and I can't use any of it. His voice grew quieter as he started to panic. I knew about the $600 million being collateral because I knew about the $600 million being used as collateral because I helped with my father-in-law's end-of-life planning. He had asked me to handle things if anything happened to them. Since he passed away, I was going to use the $600 million to settle his debts. But since my ex suddenly demanded a divorce, I left the paperwork to him, telling him to take care of the rest. What did Dad do with the $600 million? My ex asked. He used it for something he loved, I replied. What does that mean? He asked, confused. At over 72, Dad decided his next job would be his last and used his savings for something he enjoyed that seafood processing and distribution company in Germany he always talked about. He trusted the management to locals and planned to enjoy his retirement here, but it was a huge failure, and he lost almost everything. When he told me about it, he laughed, saying it was only natural since he did it without any real knowledge. He had no regrets about where he spent his money. To start that company, he borrowed $600 million, using his savings as collateral. But it turned into debt, so he planned to repay it with another job. It seemed impossible, but he didn't think so. Even with the debt, he kept enough money for his retirement. In today's world, where many struggle in retirement, it's impressive. However, while sorting out the Germany company, his health declined. When that happened, he renegotiated his repayment plan with the bank. Given his long history of high-value transactions, they trusted him. He told them, 
If I can't work anymore, take the collateral. They agreed to a two-year grace period, after which the debt would be paid off with the collateral if he couldn't work. That year is up, and it's time to settle the debt. So this $600 million is debt repayment money, and will soon be zero. My ex asked, his voice filled with shock. Exactly. Didn't you find another bank account? There should be one for living expenses. Yeah, I found one with $80,000 in it. That's money you can use freely. It's your inheritance. $600 million turned into $80,000. Why didn't he prepare more for his retirement? My ex wondered, clearly surprised. I was surprised by the $80,000 too, but knowing him, he probably planned to add more if needed. He seemed capable of anything. And it looks like you haven't checked the will yet. Will? Dad told me he'd leave me about 20%, my ex said. We're divorcing, so you could contest it as infringing on your rightful inheritance, but I'd like to honor his wishes. I hope you'll agree to the 20%, I said, noticing he was breathing heavily. He thought he'd get $600 million, but the amount kept shrinking, and now he was panicking. Why did he waste so much money? He could have bought anything with $600 million, my ex yelled, frustrated. Yelling at me won't change anything. He was happiest when he talked about that time, so he had no regrets. It was his money, and he used it. He planned to repay the debt himself, so no one can complain. You just jumped to conclusions and got ahead of yourself, I replied. Why are you so panicked? I asked. The truth is, I thought I'd get $600 million, so I spent all my own money. My account is empty, he admitted. What? Seriously? I was shocked. My ex-husband had been spending money he didn't even have yet. Now that we were divorced, he couldn't rely on my savings anymore, and he was currently unemployed. I finally understood why he was so panicked. Still, you have a roof over your head and a house, so you can rebuild your life, right? I suggested. I'm almost 54, unemployed, and have only a little savings. What's going to happen to me? Please help me, he pleaded. Me? You have savings and a job, don't you? Why should I help an ex-husband? You're suffering the consequences of your own actions, I said firmly. Please, let's pretend the divorce never happened, he begged, but I ignored his pleas and hung up the phone. Having a careless personality is definitely not a good thing. With that thought, I went back to looking at property listings. Surprisingly, my ex-husband did follow through with the will and gave me $40,000 from my father-in-law's inheritance. That made up for the money he had taken from me. He probably thought it was too much trouble to fuss over $40,000 after dealing with the $600 million situation. He also apparently started working in sales again, but he didn't seem to be taking it seriously. The shock of not getting the $600 million affected his motivation, leading to frequent mistakes. After a month of struggling under the scolding of younger supervisors, he saw his paycheck and lost motivation comparing it to the $600 million he missed out on. He quit after just a month and is now a part-time worker, barely making enough to get by. But with that, his savings of $600,000 won't increase. In fact, it'll probably decrease. I wonder if he's thinking about his retirement? Well, whatever trouble he gets into now is not my concern. There's no ATM for him anymore. He'll have to work hard. I rented a small condo and started living on my own. I put the $40,000 from my father-in-law into my bank account. I consider it a kind of talisman, so I don't plan on spending it. Seeing it in the account feels like I'm carrying a bit of my father-in-law's work spirit with me, which motivates me. Today, I'll draw strength from him and do my best at work. My name is Julie, and this is the story of how my life was turned upside down, not once, but twice. I guess I should start from the beginning. I was born to loving parents, Larry and Joanna David, in a small suburban town. My dad was a journalist, and my mom worked as a nurse. We weren't rich, but we were happy. Life was pretty normal until I turned 14, 
and then everything changed. It was a rainy Friday evening when my parents were driving home from a dinner party. I was at home with my grandma, watching some silly cartoon when the phone rang. I'll never forget the chill that went through me when I heard my grandma crying softly in the kitchen. The next few days were a blur. They told us mom had died instantly in the crash. Dad survived, but just barely. When I finally saw him in the hospital, he was just a shadow of the man I once knew. His legs were crushed, and the doctor said he'd never walk again. Julie, he whispered, reaching for my hand. I'm so sorry, sweetie. I'm so sorry. I didn't understand why he was apologizing. It wasn't his fault a drunk driver had crashed into their car. But as I got older, I realized he was sorry for what our lives had become, for the struggles we would face, for the mother I had lost, and for the father he thought he could no longer be. But my dad, Larry David, was stronger than he gave himself credit for. After he got out of the hospital and adjusted to life in a wheelchair, he threw himself into his work. He had always been a talented writer, and now he focused all his energy on his job as an editor at the city's major newspaper. As I entered my teenage years, Dad made sure I had everything I needed. He encouraged me to join clubs, make friends, and have as normal a life as possible. But the truth was, I preferred spending time with him. We watched old movies together, argued about books, and he helped me with my homework. When it was time for college, Dad insisted that I go away to school. You need to spread your wings, kiddo, he said. Don't worry about me, I'll be fine. I was hesitant, but I knew he was right, so I went off to college. I went to the State University of New York and studied accounting. That's where I met Emma, who became my best friend. Through Emma, I met her second cousin, Paul. Paul was kind and funny, and he didn't flinch when I told him about my dad. In fact, the first time he met Dad, they got along right away, bonding over their shared love of classic rock. Later, Paul told me, your dad is cool, and you're amazing for taking care of him all these years. I tried to play it off, but inside I was glowing. For the first time since the accident, I felt like maybe, just maybe, I could have a normal life, a life with love, laughter, and even a family of my own someday. After graduation, things started to fall into place like a puzzle. I got a job at the local tax service, and Paul started working as a long-haul truck driver. We dated for four years before he proposed to me on a crisp autumn evening in the park where we had our first date. I was thrilled, but there was one thing I needed to make clear. Yes, Paul, but I can't leave my dad. He needs me. Paul smiled wide and said, I wouldn't have it any other way. We'll all live together. Your dad's apartment is big enough for the three of us, right? The wedding was small but beautiful. Dad insisted on wheeling himself down the aisle to give me away. There wasn't a dry eye in the place. As I stood there, holding Paul's hand, I felt like I was living a fairy tale. But every fairy tale has its villains, and mine came in the form of my mother-in-law, Maria, and my sister-in-law, Olivia. From the moment I met them, I could tell they didn't approve of me. So your father is handicapped? Maria asked during our first meeting, wrinkling her nose like she smelled something bad. He's disabled, I corrected, trying to stay calm. But he works as an editor. How nice, she interrupted, clearly not interested. Then she turned to Paul and asked, Are you sure about this? There are so many nice girls from good families. I felt my face flush with anger and embarrassment, but Paul immediately defended me. Mom, Julie is from a good family. Her dad's disability doesn't change that. I love her, and that's all that matters. That shut Maria up, but I could still see the disapproval in her eyes. Olivia, following her mother's lead, was just as cold towards me after the wedding. True to his word, Paul moved in with dad and me and our life settled into a comfortable routine. I'd go to work at the tax office, while Paul was on the road for days at a time. When he was home, we'd all have dinner together. But whenever Maria and Olivia visited, the atmosphere in our home changed. They acted like they owned the place, barely acknowledging Dad's presence. Once, I overheard Maria whispering to Olivia, 
It's a shame. Paul could have done so much better. Now he's stuck with this girl and her crippled father. What if they have children? Can you imagine the genes? I was furious, but I kept quiet for Paul's sake. I tried to keep the peace, but it was getting harder and harder. One evening, after a particularly tense visit from Maria and Olivia, I broke down in tears. Paul found me in our bedroom, crying. Hey, hey, he said, pulling me into his arms. What's wrong? Your mom and sister, I sobbed. They hate me. They think I'm not good enough for you because of dad. Paul's face hardened. That's ridiculous. You and your dad are my family now. If they can't accept that, it's their problem, not ours. His words comforted me, but I couldn't shake the feeling that this was just the beginning of our troubles with Maria and Olivia. As the months went by, Paul's trucking business began to grow. He was always on the road, traveling across the country in his big rig. I missed him terribly when he was gone, but I focused on my work at the tax office and spent my evenings keeping Dad company. One crisp autumn evening, as I was helping Dad into bed, Paul called. His voice crackled with excitement over the phone. Julie, I've been thinking, he said. How would you feel about buying a townhouse? It would be easier for your dad to move around in a wheelchair. He could spend more time outside. Plus, you could have a garden, something to keep you busy when I'm on the road. The more he talked, the more I liked the idea. I glanced at Dad, who was pretending not to eavesdrop. What do you think, Dad? I asked, putting the phone on speaker. Dad's eyes lit up. A garden would be nice, he admitted, and it would be easier to get outside. That settled it. Over the next few weeks, we threw ourselves into house hunting. We finally found the perfect place, a spacious townhouse with wide doorways, a roll-in shower for Dad, and a beautiful backyard. Taking out a mortgage was scary, but with Paul's income, mine, and the rent from Dad's old apartment, we managed to make it work. We moved in on a sunny Sunday in spring, and I'll never forget the look on Dad's face as he wheeled himself out onto our new patio. This is perfect, sweetie, he said, his eyes misty. Thank you. We spent the next few months settling in and making the place our own. I planted a small vegetable garden, and Dad would sit outside for hours, enjoying the sunshine and fresh air. It was peaceful, almost perfect. Then we decided to have a housewarming party. We invited friends, colleagues, and yes, even Maria and Olivia. The party was in full swing when they showed up, fashionably late as usual. They walked in, looking around with barely hidden envy. As we walked through the house, I could see Maria thinking about something. When we reached the master bedroom, she turned to me with a sly smile. You know, Julie, she said quietly, this would be perfect for Paul and me. Why don't you send your father to a nursing home? Then I could move in here. I felt like I'd been slapped. Excuse me, I managed to say. Oh, don't look so shocked, Maria continued. Your father isn't well. He's not a whole person anymore, is he? He doesn't need all this luxury. A nursing home would be more than enough for someone in his condition. Before I could respond, Maria marched out to the patio where Dad was talking with some guests. To my horror, she grabbed the handles of his wheelchair and started pushing him toward the driveway. Maria, I shouted, running after her. What are you doing? If he won't go to a nursing home, he can stay outside, she sneered. That's what you wanted, isn't it? For him to be outdoors? I was shaking with rage and disbelief. Thankfully, Paul heard the commotion and came running. His face turned red with anger when he saw what his mother was doing. Mom, he yelled. What the hell are you doing? Let go of Larry's chair right now. Maria looked shocked by Paul's tone. But honey, I was just. I don't want to hear it, Paul cut her off. You and Olivia need to leave now. After they left, Paul apologized over and over to Dad and me. I'm so sorry, he said, his voice breaking. I had no idea she would do that. I'm just so sorry. Dad reached out and patted Paul's hand. It's not your fault, son, he said gently. Some people just can't understand. 
life settled into a new routine after that incident. Maria and Olivia kept their distance, which was fine with me. Paul focused on his work, taking on more long-haul routes to help pay for our new home. I split my time between my job at the tax office, taking care of our home, and looking after Dad. Four years passed quickly. Our life became comfortable and predictable. Paul was on the road most of the time, but when he was home, our little family was happy. Dad's health was stable, and he seemed content, spending his days in the garden or working on his editing from home. Then came the call that shattered my world. I was at work when my phone rang. A man's unfamiliar voice greeted me, Mrs. Walker, this is Officer Andrew from the Highway Patrol. My heart sank. Yes, I barely managed to say. I'm sorry to inform you that your husband, Paul Walker, has been in a serious accident. The rest of the conversation was a blur. Words like head-on collision and didn't make it floated around me, but I couldn't understand them. It wasn't until I heard myself thanking the officer and hanging up that the reality began to hit me Paul was gone. The next week was a fog of grief and disbelief. I went through the motions of planning the funeral like a robot, barely understanding what was happening. The day before the funeral, I gathered my courage and called Maria. I thought she deserved to hear about her son's death from me, not from a newspaper obituary. Hello, Maria's sharp voice answered. Maria, it's Julie, I said, my voice trembling. It's about Paul. He's gone. There was an accident. There was silence on the other end of the line, and then, to my shock, Maria's voice came back, dripping with anger. This is your fault, she hissed. You made him work so hard, driving that truck to pay for your fancy house. You killed my son. I was stunned. Maria, I that's not, save it, she snapped. I expect you to give him the best funeral money can buy, but don't expect a penny from us. You made your bed, now lie in it. The line went dead. I stood there, foam in hand, tears streaming down my face. How could she be so cruel? How could she blame me for this? The day of Paul's funeral was gray and rainy, matching my mood perfectly. The church was full. Paul was well-liked in the community and it seemed like half the town had come to pay their respects. After the service, as people passed by to offer their condolences, I noticed that Paul's mother and sister were nowhere to be seen. They hadn't even bothered to show up for their own son and brother's funeral. Dad reached out and squeezed my hand. It's their loss, sweetie. We're family, and we'll get through this together. As we pulled into our driveway, something seemed off. The lights were on in the house, which was strange because I was sure I had turned everything off before we left. Did you leave any lights on, Dad? I asked, frowning. He shook his head. No, I don't think so. As we got closer, I noticed movement inside the house. My heart started pounding, were we being robbed on the day of Paul's funeral? I quickly helped Dad out of the car and into his wheelchair, my mind racing. Should I call the police? But as we approached the front door, I heard familiar voices inside. A chill ran down my spine as I recognized them. I pushed open the door to find Maria and Olivia in our living room, surrounded by boxes and pieces of furniture. What the hell is going on here? I demanded, my grief momentarily forgotten in the face of this outrageous intrusion. Maria turned to me, her face a mask of fake sympathy. Oh, Julie, dear, we're just helping you pack up. After all, you can't possibly afford to keep this place now that Paul is gone. I was speechless. Olivia added, her voice sickeningly sweet. Don't worry, you can go back to your father's apartment. It's cozy. I could feel the anger building inside me. Get out, I said, my voice low and dangerous. Get out of my house right now. Maria had the nerve to look offended. This house belongs to us now. All of Paul's property does we're his family after all. Like hell you are, I exploded. Where were you today, at his funeral? Oh, that's right you couldn't be bothered to show up. Maria waved her hand dismissively. We were busy making arrangements. Now be a good girl and start packing. We'll meet you out by tomorrow. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. 
These women hadn't shed a tear for Paul, hadn't even attended his funeral, and now they were trying to kick us out of our home. I'm calling the police, I said, pulling out my phone. Maria and Olivia exchanged worried looks they clearly hadn't expected me to fight back. Now Julie, Maria began, but I cut her off. No, you have exactly ten minutes to get out of my house before I call the cops. This is my home. Paul and I bought it together. You have no right to be here. Maybe it was the steel in my voice or the fire in my eyes, but Maria and Olivia finally realized they had gone too far. They gathered their things and left, but not before Maria turned to me with a sneer. This isn't over, Julie. You'll be hearing from our lawyers. The days after Paul's funeral were a blur of grief, anxiety, and paperwork. I threw myself into sorting out Paul's affairs, partly to keep busy and partly out of fear that Maria and Olivia would try to take what wasn't theirs. A week after the funeral, I received a call from a local law firm. My heart pounded as I answered the call, afraid it was Maria, following through on her threat of legal action. Mrs. Walker, a crisp, professional voice asked. This is Scott Thompson from Thompson & Partners. I'm calling about your late husband's will. I felt a small flicker of hope. His will? I didn't know he had one. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Walker came to see us about five months ago. He asked that we contact you in the event of his passing. I scheduled an appointment for the next day, my mind spinning. Why hadn't Paul told me about this? What did it mean? The next morning, I wheeled Dad into Mr. Thompson's office. The lawyer greeted us warmly, his kind eyes crinkling at the corners. Mrs. Walker, Mr. David, thank you for coming in, he said, gesturing for us to sit near his desk. I'm sorry for your loss. Mr. Thompson opened a file on his desk. Now, as I mentioned on the phone, your husband came to see us to draft his will. He was very clear about his wishes. I held my breath as Mr. Thompson began to read. I, Paul Walker, being of sound mind, do hereby leave all my worldly possessions to my beloved wife, Julie Walker. I gasped, and Dad's grip on my hand tightened. Mr. Thompson continued, This includes our home, my truck, and all our savings. It is my wish that Julie use these resources to care for herself and her father, Larry David, whom I have come to love as my own. Tears streamed down my face, even from beyond the grave. Paul was taking care of us. There's more, Mr. Thompson said gently. Mr. Walker left a letter for you. He handed me an envelope. With shaking hands, I opened it and began to read. My dearest Julie, if you're reading this, it means I'm gone. I'm so sorry for leaving you and Larry. Please know that you two are the best thing that ever happened to me. I made this will because I know how my mother and sister can be. I didn't want to worry you but I needed to make sure you and Larry were protected if anything happened to me. You're my real family, Julie, you and Larry, not them. Take care of each other, live your lives to the fullest, and know that I'll always be watching over you. All my love, Paul. I clutched the letter to my chest, sobbing. Dad was crying too, his weathered hand patting my arm. Mr. Thompson gave us a moment before speaking again. Mrs. Walker, there's one more thing. Your husband's truck was insured. Given the circumstances of the accident, the insurance company will be paying out the full value of the policy. I looked up, sniffling, and asked, what does that mean? Mr. Thompson gave me a small smile and said, it means you'll be receiving a large sum of money, enough to pay off your mortgage and more. As we left the lawyer's office, I felt like a weight had been lifted from my shoulders. We were going to be okay Paul had made sure of it. As we pulled into our driveway, I noticed a familiar car parked on the street. My heart sank as I recognized Maria's sleek Satan. Oh no, I muttered, what now? Sure enough, Maria and Olivia were waiting on our front porch. But this time, I wasn't afraid. I had Paul's letter in my pocket and the strength of his love in my heart. Julie, Maria began as we approached, her voice sickly sweet, we need to talk about Paul's estate. 
I stood tall, looking her straight in the eye. No, Maria, we don't. Paul left everything to me. It's all legal and official. And do you want to know why? Because we were his real family, not you. Now please leave your trespassing on my property. For once, Maria was speechless. Olivia tugged at her arm, whispering urgently. With one last venomous glare, they got in their car and drove away. The weeks after our meeting with the lawyer were busy. I threw myself into settling Paul's affairs, grateful for the distraction from my grief. The insurance payout came through. And just as Mr. Thompson had said, it was enough to pay off our mortgage with plenty left over. One afternoon, as I was going through Paul's desk, I found a small notebook. Curious, I opened it and saw pages filled with his messy handwriting. It was a journal of sorts, full of his thoughts and plans for our future. Thinking about starting a college fund for our future kids, one entry read. Want to make sure they have the best start in life. My heart clenched. We had talked about having children someday, but had decided to wait until we were more financially stable. Now, reading Paul's private hopes and dreams, I felt a fresh wave of grief wash over me. Oh, Paul, I whispered, holding the notebook close, we had so many plans. That night, I tossed and turned, unable to sleep. My mind kept drifting to the journal, to the future we'd never have. When I finally drifted off, I dreamed of Paul. He was smiling, holding out his hand to me. It's okay, Jali, he said in my dream. Everything's going to be all right. I woke up the next morning feeling different. I couldn't quite figure out what it was, but something had changed. As I got ready for work, a wave of nausea hit me, and I barely made it to the bathroom in time. The morning sickness didn't go away in the days that followed. At first, I thought it was just stress and grief, but a small voice in the back of my mind suggested something else. After a week of this, I found myself in the pharmacy, staring at pregnancy tests. With trembling hands, I bought one and hurried home. The five minutes I waited for the result felt like the longest of my life. When I finally looked at the test, there were two clear blue lines. I sank to the bathroom floor, overwhelmed by a mix of emotions joy, fear, grief, and hope all swirling together. Julie, Dad's voice came through the door. Everything okay in there? I opened the door, tears streaming down my face. Dad's expression changed from concern to alarm. What's wrong, sweetie? he asked. I held up the test, my hand shaking. I'm pregnant, Dad. I fell into his arms, sobbing. He held me, stroking my hair like he used to when I was a little girl. It's okay, he murmured. It's going to be okay. You're not alone, Julie. And this baby, this baby is a gift, a piece of Paul that will live on. His words hit me deeply. This baby was a part of Paul, a continuation of our love. Suddenly, the fear began to fade, replaced by a strong determination. You're right, I said, wiping my eyes. This baby is a gift, and we're going to be okay. Dad smiled, his eyes crinkling at the corners. That's my girl. Now let's get you something to eat you're eating for two now, after all. As we headed to the kitchen, I felt a sense of hope growing inside me. The road ahead would be challenging, but with my father by my side and Paul's child growing inside me, I knew we could face anything. As my belly grew with our child, I found strength I never knew I had. Dad was my rock, always there with a kind word or a helping hand. We settled into a new routine, just the two of us, eagerly awaiting the arrival of the newest member of our little family. One sunny afternoon, as I was tending to the garden Dad and I had planted together, I heard a car pull up. My heart sank as I recognized Maria's sedan. What could they possibly want now? I walked to the front of the house, one hand instinctively resting on my swollen belly. Maria and Olivia stood on our porch, looking both comfortable and slightly desperate. Julie, Maria began, her voice missing its usual sharpness. We need to talk to you. I raised an eyebrow, but said nothing, waiting for her to continue. Olivia spoke up, her eyes darting around nervously. We've hit some hard times. We were wondering if we could stay in your father's old apartment, 
just until we get back on our feet. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. After everything they had put us through, they had the nerve to ask for more. I'm sorry, I said, my voice firm but calm, that's not possible. I don't want to communicate with you anymore. Maria's eyes narrowed as they noticed my pregnant belly. Her face twisted with shock and disgust. You're pregnant, she spat. Already, you little prostitute. I can't believe you've already found a new man. Paul's body isn't even cold in the ground. I felt a surge of anger, but I pushed it down. I didn't bother explaining that it was Paul's child. I didn't want my baby to have such a grandmother and aunt. Instead, I smiled a small, secretive smile that seemed to unsettle Maria even more. My personal life is none of your concern, I said calmly. Now I think it's time for you to leave. Maria looked like she wanted to say more, but something in my expression must have stopped her. She turned on her heel, grabbing Olivia's arm. I watched as they drove away, feeling a sense of peace wash over me. I had stood my ground, protected my family, and kept my dignity. Paul would have been proud.